Okay. Well, let's get into it. Um, if you guys hadn't noticed, me and Kyle have been having a, um, like a prop battle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? Like I had the blocks with the, the joint compound, and then he did like the dominoes of death thing that was really beautiful. And then we brought in the glove. Remember that one? And you remember what he did last week? He brought in a potter. <laughs> like a legit pot. Like somebody that made a clay pot on stage during the sermon. So then I just decided, no, no, we're not, I'm not doing a prop this week. I'm done with that game. That game's over. I don't even have a good, I mean, I don't have an image, right? Like, we're just jumping right in. So... But like I said, I, I really feel an emphasis this morning um, that we take some time to acknowledge what I said earlier, uh, that practicing or pursuing God's presence is better than good principles. And a lot of times we can just cling on to good principles and not have the confidence to know how to approach God in a way that actually impacts us and I'll even say actually moves him. Um, because that's who God is. He is a being who has decided of his own volition that he wants to be in a dynamic, real relationship with human beings, not just imposing rules on them and not just imposing principles on them for them to like navigate their life by, but to be in an actual, dynamic, real relationship with them. And in that relationship, he moves us and even allows us to move him. And that's an enormous gift that I don't think uh, that we emphasize enough or even give enough time to. Uh, and so the beauty of, of what's going on in the book of Acts, which we're studying right now, is that there is a story that is told back to back two times. So basically what Kyle preached on last week, the text this week is the exact same story retold by Peter nearly word for word. So I want to highlight a few things in there. I want to jump into it. I want to highlight a few things in there. Um, and then as I highlight things, I want to bring those around to, to the end as we worship. And I kind of want to guide us through just a time to encounter the Lord. That's really what, I'm, what I would like to do today. Because I think what happens is the handles that we get in church are that you come and hear principles. And then what we do before is we sing songs and you just kind of vocalize those songs. But a lot of times there's not really good handles on how you might go home and encounter a difficult place in your life and then have a good handle or a good method or a good approach to the Lord and feel confident that you are giving and receiving inside of a relationship. You kind of just get stuck there like staring at the ceiling. Do you know what I mean? And like, like... God, talk to me. Okay, well, I'll read the Bible then. You know what I mean? You kind of get lost in this, this, this weirdness because we as Westerners do not have a lot of guidance around what it looks like for a physical being, a human, to engage with a spiritual being, God. Because we are definitely very physical creatures here in the West. Everything is what our eyes can see and what we can hear and what we can understand with our minds. And the whole concept of the spiritual world being next to us and a part of this reality and one that we can engage in is just not something that we grew up learning or engaging with. And so that's why I want to give us a little time to do that today. You guys with me then? Let's roll with it then. Let's roll with it. Okay, um, real quick, I need to give you just a touch of backstory before we jump in. Um, okay, you guys, you know how Israel is called the, the chosen race, or it's called the cho- God's chosen people? You're, you're familiar with that, right? So I, I need us to understand that for a minute before we jump into, in, into the text that we're in today, because understanding that and having that, that mindset and where that comes from and why that is what that is really governs our understanding of what's going on in the text. So, so I think when we hear that phrase that, that Israel is God's chosen people, what we think is that God chose this one nation out of all these other nations to kind of give them a better existence or to like bless them and not bless other people or to just take them to heaven or something like that. Like when they die, these people go to heaven and everybody else, nah, we don't really care about you other human beings because you're not Israel. And, and it can kind of come off that way. But here, I want you to follow me in this. Um, 
Israel, when, when God says that this is my chosen people, what he means is this is my chosen people to advance my purposes or my mission on the earth. Not a chosen people to just receive better things, but they are chosen to do something on God's behalf on the planet. That's why they were chosen in the Old Testament, right? That's why they exist there. They're chosen to advance God's purposes on the earth. So then that, that begs the question, what is God's purpose on the earth? And the whole dominoes of death is a great way of understanding what God's purpose is on the earth, right? God's purpose on the earth is not to send Jesus to it so that when you die, you can leave the earth and go to heaven, and then that's the end of the story. God's purpose on the earth is to restore everything that has gone wrong on this planet and to roll back death and to roll back pain and to roll back fear and to make the earth what it was always intended to be, which was a flourishing physical place governed by human beings in relationship to that divine being, creator, Yahweh, God. That was the original design. And so God's purposes on the earth from the beginning of the Bible is to fix that problem. So when Kyle talked about the dominoes of death, he was talking about physical death being the last thing that falls because what falls before that is relational death, financial death, spiritual death. There's all these aspects of our life that are not what they are supposed to be. And we can feel it as we move through life. And we can feel that things are not the way that they're supposed to be. And the promise of God to humanity, not just to Israel, is that he is going to set all of those things right. And when Jesus came, he did perfectly what Israel did not do perfectly. They did not advance God's purposes on the earth. And so Jesus comes to do that perfectly. And that's the role of Jesus in the story, is that Israel was chosen by God to do some things on this earth. And they failed time after time after time, not because they are worse than other people, but because they are humans like everybody else. And in Israel, you get to see a picture of humanity that humanity, even if they are given good principles, even if they are given good and perfect rules, those rules don't do anything to bring about the type of flourishing that God has in mind for his creation. So those principles aren't bad, and those rules are not bad. They are good things, but they are not powerful things apart from God himself being in connection with his people the Israelites, and the Israelites continually walked away from God. They walked away from their creator until Jesus comes along to do perfectly, to do perfectly what Israel failed to do. And so um, that's the kind of a, a snapshot of how to understand the Old Testament in some respects, is that the Old Testament is the story of God's relationship to a nation called Israel that was always there to try to gather all the other nations who had walked away from God back to God. And they were unable to do that and in steps Jesus to do that very thing. So that's kind of context for when we jump into this story. So let's do that. We're in Acts 11. We're going to go to verse 1, and we're going to read down uh, to about 12, and then I want to paraphrase a little bit, and then we'll, we'll close it out. So let's do that. Uh, now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles, so when it says Gentiles, that's just anybody who's not Jewish, okay? So when we use that phrase, um, that's the way the Bible refers to non-Jewish people, because keep in mind, Jesus is the Jewish or the Israelite Messiah, and so everything that he does is in the context of being an Israelite person. And so everybody who is not an Israelite person at this point in history does not believe that the creator God is their God. Follow me here for a minute, okay? We don't think that because we're 2,000 years later and the world is a different place. But 2,000 years ago, Israel had a God. People in South America had a God. Tribes in North America had a God. Like, your people group had a God associated with that people group. Egyptians had a God. Like, I mean, go to museums and you're going to get to look at nationalities and their gods and they're interwoven and people don't get to just take on other gods from other peoples because those gods belong to those nations and those nations belong to those gods that's very true of the way the old testament is written it's very true of the understanding of the old testament so it's it's in kind it's kind of incomprehensible at this point in history for a gentile a non-jewish person to even want to or be able to be in relationship with israel's god that doesn't make sense right 
But for us, we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you just go to a, a world religions class, and then you pick the religion that you want to follow, and then you kind of mosey on along those principles and do those things. That's not the way the world was structured 2,000 years ago, okay? So, throughout Judea, heard that the Gentiles also, so these non-Jewish people, they've received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Follow me here real quick. You've got Jesus comes along, an Israelite who is fulfilling all of the promises of the Old Testament, living a perfect life. He's crucified. He's resurrected. And what he says when he is resurrected to these 12 Jewish guys is, I want you to take what I've done and the truth of that message and the beauty of that message and the freedom of that message and the power of that message, I want you to take it to Jerusalem. Then I want you to take it to a region outside of Jerusalem called Judea. Then I want, to take, I want you to take it outside of Israel altogether to a place called Samaria. And then I want you to take it to the rest of the world. So these 12 men are now like, oh, so this whole, this whole Jesus thing is for the whole world. Okay, so they're getting a glimpse of that. So now in the story, that's actually beginning to happen. But here's the deal. You've got these people that are following Jesus. And everybody's kind of down and cool. And it's in Jerusalem. And everything's fine. It's a bunch of Israelite people. But you have this little group inside the church at that time that believed that even though you became a Christian, you still had to follow all of the Jewish laws. Right? The most important one being circumcision. Okay? So if you were a person who decided to follow Jesus, there was this group inside the church that said, okay, if you're going to follow the Jewish Messiah, you've got to follow the Jewish laws, and the Jewish laws say that males need to be circumcised. So it doesn't matter how old you are. Here's the scissors. Get to work. <laughs> it's a very small part of the Christian church, and they were called the circumcision party. Okay. What just crossed your mind, Jesus? <laughs> Ain't no party like a circumcision party, right? That's what crossed your mind. <laughs> this is a Bible, bro, okay? I couldn't make this up if I wanted to. That's not what I would make up if I did. <laughs> but you have this group there. And, and part of that is not just that they need to be circumcised, but part of it is that they need to follow all of Jewish law. And keep in mind, there's a lot of Jewish laws that feel really weird to us. But one of the Jewish laws is that Jewish men and women do not eat with people who are not Jewish. Because if they do, they become unclean. And what that means is they cannot go into the temple and access the presence of God. They cannot go offer sacrifices to cleanse their wrongdoings for that week. They, by eating with a non-Jewish person actually become cut off from the people of Israel until they do ritual cleansings to get back in, right? So that's part of that Jewish law. So you have this group called the Circumcision Party, and it's not just about circumcision. It's about you have to essentially become Jewish if you're going to worship the Jewish God, or you have to become Jewish to follow the Jewish Messiah. You've got to do that. And then you've got this growing group of people around that that are unsure if that's correct, but they're not quite sure that they can go that far. Let me explain why. Because up to this point, Israel has failed to follow their God, Yahweh, over and 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 over. And God has come to them through prophet after prophet after prophet saying, return to me, return to my covenants, return to my way of living, return to me, and I will restore everything that's gone wrong. But if you continue to worship the gods of these other nations that really are demonic entities, if you continue to worship those gods, then I'm going to remove you from Israel so that you can worship those gods in other nations. So if you want to worship the Babylonian god, go ahead. But it's not going to be in my land, Israel. You're going to be removed from Israel to Babylon, and you can worship those gods over there. And so God slowly, I mean hundreds of years, he is going to his people saying, hey, I, we got to do something different because you're worshiping Babylonian gods. And that doesn't mean that they're singing songs to Babylonian gods. It means they're taking their own children and sacrificing them at the altar of these gods. It's not just like you, you, you like chose to follow these principles. No, they're doing things that are harmful to Israel and they're doing it in the name of Yahweh, but it's really in worshiping these other gods, right? So... For the circumcision party, it, 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 like, this is a real deal thing for them. 
they don't want to offend God. They don't, want to go, they don't want to cross him. They are really trying to do their best to honor what they were told to do from the beginning because Mosaic law says all these things. And God was always coming back and saying, hey, the law that I gave you in Moses is good and right and pleasing and good for humanity. It's good for you. Now come and walk in it and don't walk away from it. And if you walk away from it, things will happen to you that are not good. And so he's constantly going to him. So now Jesus comes along and these people are still shaped by that. They've been in exile, like in, they've been kicked out of Israel, then brought back to Israel, and then the Greeks have come and conquered them, and the Romans have come and conquered them, and all of them believe that the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians and the Egyptians and all of that conquering that has happened to these people, they believe it's because they did not follow the rules rightly, and they are partly right in that. So for the circumcision to pop up and say, hey, Peter, you're breaking the rules, bro. That is something meaningful. There's gravity to it. It's not just that they came up with something that they thought would be a fun part to add to Christianity. Do you know what I mean? That's not a fun part to add to Christianity. That would severely limit church growth if the circumcision party won the game. Do you know what I'm saying? Come and receive the good news. Right? (laughs) No props. That's why I did no props today. So, the circumcision party criticized Peter, and they said, you went to non-Jewish people, and you ate with them. So, when I say that there's a principle there, I want you to understand it's a right principle. It is a godly principle given by God in the Old Testament. They are follow- they, this is not a rule they made up. They are following a godly, good principle given to them by God himself. When Moses went up on the mountain and spoke with God directly, this is what was received. But Peter began and he explained this to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa and I was praying. And then in a trance, I saw a vision Something like a great sheet descended down, and it was let down from heaven by its four corners. It came down to me, and I looked at it closely, and I saw animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. All four, all four of those are animals that Israelites cannot touch. Okay, birds, birds of the air are birds that eat dead things lying on the ground. A buzzard. Bird of the air is a buzzard. Beasts of prey, those are beasts that eat other living animals. You can't eat those if you're an Israelite. You can't touch those. Israelites can't touch dogs because dogs go and eat dead things, right? So you follow me here. So he's seeing a sheet come down from heaven filled with animals that he, as a good Jewish man, is not allowed to touch or much less eat, okay? Again, that's not something he made up. That's him being faithful to a principle that he was given by God, following a faithful Mosaic tradition, okay? And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And then Peter responds, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, don't call it common. This happened three times, and then all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them. So in that trance, God is preparing Peter to go with these men, because when he encounters these men, those men are going to take him to visit another guy who is not a Jewish person, And God has spoken to that guy who is not a Jewish person and said, I want you to send your people and go get a guy named Peter who's in Joppa and bring him here and he's going to tell you all of the good news, right? So Peter goes with these three men, gets to a house that he's not supposed to be in as a good Jewish man, and he encounters a centurion who's a Roman soldier who is actively oppressing his people, and that Roman centurion is a God-fearer. He, he likes the Jewish God and wants to follow the Jewish God, Yahweh, which is very interesting. And he's what looks to be a kind man. He gives to the poor. He prays to Yahweh and not to the Roman gods, right? He doesn't pray to Zeus. He prays to Yahweh. But 
up to this point in history, he's a second-class citizen to a Jewish person. If he was going to really follow the Jewish God, again, he'd have to be circumcised. He could go to the temple, but he'd never go into the temple. He could never even go into the main courtyard. He'd have to stay on the outside in the, in the courts of the Gentiles. So he would be a completely second-class citizen. He would never be able to take part in the feast. He would never be able to eat with Jewish people. He would never be able to do those things. So now... God has told this man to seek out Peter, and God has told Peter to go with this man, and he has prepared him to go into that house by literally dictating in a trance to Peter to violate the rules that he himself gave to Israel a thousand years before. This is interesting, right? All of you woke up this morning, and you were like, gosh, is there somebody that can drag me through Jewish customs and laws? And I woke up thinking, I would really like to drag these people through Jewish customs and laws. So here we are. Here we are. So this is what happened. Peter begins talking to the centurion and explaining Jesus to him. And while Peter's in mid-sentence, the Holy Spirit comes in a powerful manifestation on him in the entire house in the exact same way that it had come on Peter in the beginning of Acts when the Holy Spirit came into the room and there were tongues of fire and they were speaking in tongues and it was this wild moment. There was wind and fire, which is a symbol of the presence of God, and now it's happening to this person that it's not supposed to be happening to. Right? Yeah, it's really beautiful. And so the the reason that we're retelling this story is because Peter is now going back to the church in Jerusalem and the church in Jerusalem is getting all caught up in principles and the right way of doing things and how are we going to organize this? What's the right? How do we approach this? And Peter comes back to that church and he's got the circumcision party criticizing him saying, hey man, you're breaking the rules. And Peter's like, I get the rules, bro. I get it. But let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. The Holy Spirit fell on them in the same way that he fell on us. So if God thinks that they are holy vessels of himself, who am I to say that they're not holy vessels of himself? Who am I to say that they're unclean or common when in fact God has in Jesus by his death and resurrection made them clean vessels of his spirit, right? So the only reason I want you to understand the circumcision party is because I want to make two points here. I want to make two points, and good, we've got some time. Okay. The good news of Jesus, like what Jesus has actually done, what Jesus has actually done for humanity if we can stop thinking about it as a story for a minute and we can stop thinking about it as a religion for a minute and we can think about it as a thing that happened in history from the creator to human beings, like let's step into that for a minute. What Jesus is saying happened when he was crucified and resurrected and how that affects you, that is news that is too good to be understood but not too good to be true. And the reality of it is it's so good, and we as human beings are so marred and plagued by the difficulties of a life that the good news feels too good to be true, and so we shave off bits of how good it is. It's exactly what the circumcision party was doing, right? For them, it's, incon- like it's inconceivable. Like We've been doing this thing for a thousand years. There's been a ton of stuff that's gone on about it. But now, because Jesus has been crucified and resurrected, now we don't have to go to Jerusalem to interact with the presence of God. The presence of God is not confined to a temple. Now you're actually saying that the, that the legit presence, like the person of God is going to live inside of a human being. So God's presence has gone from a, a building into a person? That, that is categorically different. That is categorically different than the way that all religions on the planet had ever conceived of the divine relating to them. Ever. Like, that concept is like, whoo. It is, it is inconceivable, according to all of the religions that have existed on the planet, that the divine being would not demand 
from people sacrifice, but instead become one of them and be the sacrifice himself. That is an inconceivable, like that's inconceivable, that the divine being is so good, that the creator is so good, that his response to human beings and all of their failures and all of their harming each other and all of them harming themselves and all of the greed and all of the posturing and all of the selfishness and all the things that you know you can, that comes out of you and you don't like it, like all of that stuff, that his response to it is not, I'm mad at you, I hate you, get away from me, you're unclean, you're gross. Ah, uh, his response to it is, I love you, would do anything for you. And what I do need to do for you is become one of you, to become poor like you, become broken like you, to be mistreated like you, to be oppressed like you, and then in the middle of all of that, not grow angry and hateful towards humanity, but to give his life in the most painful way possible to redeem and restore humanity back in relationship to their father. I say all that to say is because I, I think many of us carry bits and pieces, bits and pieces of the old way into the new way, because the new way is really too good to be true. The only problem is that it is true. It's so true that it's hard to believe. The circumcision party had a problem coming to grips with the fact that there's, I mean, there's no more sacrifices. There's no more ritual sacrifice. There's no more ritual cleansing. There's no more of this temple stuff. God's like one with me and with me. There's no more following the law because now the law is written on my heart and I'll be sensitive to what God wants to do. There's no more separation. All of that is like, that's too much, you know? It's too much. And then here's where I want to jump to the point of this, right? Right? What is the way in which God verifies what he's actually up to? How does God verify that truth that is too good to be true? How does he verify it? Does he write a letter? No. He shows up and encounters humanity. He invades reality. And he and himself comes and speaks to human beings to adjust words that he had already spoken before. So he understands how difficult it would be for Peter to go to the centurion's house. So what does he do? He visits him in a trance. <laughs> he visits him in a trance, right? And y'all are like, what's a trance? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yes, great question. <laughs> Apparently, it's a state of being where the divine is speaking directly to Peter and showing him images to prepare him for the next thing that he's about to do. So that's why I say practicing God's presence is greater than practicing good principles. Because you know that Bible that we read and we talk about in here and that all these churches talk about and we build all these buildings and we do all this stuff. You know what that book is a story of? It is not a story of principles. It is a story of God visiting humans, interacting with them, adjusting the course of their life, them writing it down, and then being directed by that. They are not principles in and of themselves. They are not rules in and of themselves. They are the guidance of a very, very, very good being, a very, very, very good God. They are guidance from him on how to engage in the human life. But even following those ethical teachings or those principles, apart from knowing how to interact with the divine, all of that is powerless. It might be somewhat helpful and have a degree of value, but the power comes in practicing the presence of God. The power does not come in practicing the principles. The principles can keep you safe, they can help you a little bit, they can help keep your marriage kind of inside a boundary, but the real traction in the human life comes from the human's relationship to the creator who has given everything to him and her. So here's the question, right? 
when confusion sets in or difficulty sets in or real problems set into your life, you know what the easiest place to go to is, right? It used to be self-help books, but nah. Now it's podcasts, right? Or, or really is your friends who listen to podcasts, right? <laughs> like you're in a bad way and you call your friend and you know, and they're like, oh, that's terrible. You know what I heard in this podcast? <laughs> da, 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 da. Here's some principles for you to follow. And you're like, breathing in the, the deep breath of further obligation while you're in the middle of a difficult time. But that's what we do, right? We as human beings, we try to get advice from people. We try to read books. We try to get principles. We even go to the Bible, right? And we'll search on Google. Like I'm struggling with anxiety. Here are verses on anxiety. I will read and memorize verses on anxiety. You know what's missing from that picture? God that wrote the Bible. Right? Right? The interaction with the divine, the exchange, right? Because what the Bible says when it talks about anxiety is really interesting. It says, take those burdens and bring them to him and give them to him. And then the effect from him will be a peace that surpasses all understanding, right? Memorizing that scripture is not going to bring about the peace. There is an exchange with the divine that happens As we bring the things that are going on, we trust him with those things and legit trust him. We don't just say, I give it to you, but we literally like, (sighs) it's yours. How the outcomes go is yours. Where this takes me is yours, right? There's an exchange in there. But I think because we are human beings that are physical beings and we have not been raised in the mysterious interaction of the Holy Spirit within us, that he is not in a temple and he is not in a church building, that he is in you. The Holy Spirit's only in here because he came in with you, right? The Holy Spirit's in your house because he went in there with you. The Holy Spirit's at your job because he went in there with you. But the real challenge is interacting with him while he's in there with you as you face the darkness that's, a, that's prevalent in all those places. Right, that's the, that's the challenge and the difficulty. And so yeah, as I'm reading through this, I really hesitate to consider these concepts and consider these principles and then give you a three-step process. I really want for us to make some time, really want for us to make some time to interact with our Father in heaven. Um, in a way that we can actually settle into the reality of his presence that's here and also in a way that we can exchange, right? We can, we can move him and let him know that it's okay for him to move us in a soft-hearted way.